Well, in this lecture, we're going to understand the dynamics of the storm systems that produce tornadoes. We're going to talk about what's called tornado genesis, the birth of a tornado. But before we get in there, I got a question for you. We've been talking over the last several lectures about different types of thunderstorms. We've talked about ordinary thunderstorms, those being the non-severe. We've talked about mesoscale convective systems, squall lines. We've also talked about supercells briefly. My question for you is, which of the following storm types is the largest? Is it ordinary thunderstorms, mesoscale convective systems, or supercells? Well, you might be tempted to think that supercells are the largest, but they are not. Supercells are actually quite small thunderstorms. The biggest is the squall line or the mesoscale convective system. You see, squall lines are teams of thunderstorms, groups of thunderstorms that work together as a convective system of storms. Supercells are singular storms. They're rogue. They're by themselves. They rotate violently, but they're tiny. These two images are the same scale. These are some storms over Michigan. This is a big squall line. And that's one supercell in Nebraska. Look at how small it is. But listen up. Pound for pound, the supercell is the most violent expression of weather on Earth. But it's small. It's a small thunderstorm. A typical supercell can fit inside of a county. All right? So big difference in their sizes here. So here's another question for you. I'm see if you can pull this one out of the hat from what I've taught you about tornadoes so far. In which direction do supercells typically move? Well, let me give you a hint. Supercells are the primary storm type that make tornadoes. So do supercells typically move from the northwest to southeast? That's in this direction. Do they move from the southwest to northeast? That's from here to here. Do they move from the northeast to the southwest? That's here to there. Or do they move from the southeast to the northwest? That'd be here to here. Well, let me show you a map that shows you all of the 2011 tornadoes from April. We can clearly see here that most of the trajectories of each of these storm paths is from the southwest to the northeast. Because the supercell is the storm that makes big tornadoes, well, the tornado is going to follow the direction the supercell goes. And most of them have a trajectory that is from the southwest to northeast. Now, not all of them do, but most of them do. One last question here before we get going. Over the last 50 years, what do you think the tornado false alarm rate is? In other words, how many of them do we falsely warn? 10%, 25%, 40%, 50%, or 70%? Well, let's take a look at the reason behind the answer which is 70%. This is an image taken by Tim Marshall that shows us what is called SCUD. SCUD stands for Scattered Cumulus Under Deck. A lot of thunderstorms have SCUD clouds in them. They don't rotate, but they look ominous. That, I mean, if, I, if you didn't know what you were looking at, you might think that this was a tornadic circulation. But let me tell you something. Whenever you're looking at something and you're wondering if it's a tornado, look for just two seconds if it's violently rotating, then it is. If you can't tell, I promise you it's not a tornado, okay? So scud clouds don't rotate. Here's the other reason why we have such a high, fate, uh, a high uh, false alarm rate. Well, scud is the first problem. The fact is that a lot of people will see these and think it's a tornado and, and call it into the authorities and therefore it's been misrepresented. The other reason that we get up to 70% is this problem. Tornadoes are underneath the thunderstorm. They're close to the ground. We learned a long time ago about radar and how the radar beam travels out and up. If the radar scans over the top of the tornado, well, we may only be able to see the mid-level rotation of the thunderstorm, not the tornado itself. In the Storm Prediction Center, any time that it sees rotation, any time it sees rotation, sorry, not the Storm Prediction Center, but the National Weather Service offices, any time their radar meteorologists see rotation, they will warn a thunderstorm. And that's because about 30% of the time, storms that rotate produce tornadoes. So they play the better, than sa better safe than sorry card. Now, in an ideal world, we'd have a much more vast radar network that could scan the low levels of the atmosphere everywhere, but we don't have it. So the problem is the radar beam often goes right over the top of the tornado itself. And therefore, we sometimes will warn a storm that's rotating that isn't producing a tornado. Regardless, I know this is kind of a boy who cried wolf kind of scenario. Every time the National Weather Service warns a storm for a tornado, take shelter. Take shelter. All right, the supercell. Look at this breathtaking picture taken by Brian Curry. Beautiful image here. This is what one looks like. Now, we're seeing the whole thing. This is almost all of it. It's small. 
pound for pound the most intense thunderstorm on the planet. What's the key distinguishing feature of a supercell? They rotate. They visibly spin. You can see it. I'll show you lots of great videos of this. Now, because they spin, they're typically single-celled. They're not, um, you know, a group of thunderstorms. They're single-celled thunderstorms. And the majority of these uh, massive tornadoes that are produced, nearly all severe ones, come from supercells. But supercells aren't just limited to tornadoes. They can produce hail. They can produce straight-line winds. They can do it all. Now, I want to tell you about the record holder. March 12, 2006, a supercell started in parts of Oklahoma, went through parts of Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and eventually it died in Michigan. That one supercell tracked through six states over a thousand miles and produced 37 different tornadoes. And what we have to learn about these things today is how do we recognize them on radar? How do we recognize them by seeing cloud types? And what is it that happens that makes the tornado inside the supercell? I will never, ever, ever forget this day because one of those supercells went right over my grandmother's house and destroyed it. Now, thankfully, she was perfectly safe in her basement where I told her to go, but it nearly just destroyed a big section of Springfield, Illinois. That was just one of the damage reports from this particular event. We're going to study images like this. Understanding hook echoes, hail cores, and the overall structure of the supercell itself. Now, I told you supercells rotate. In 2016, we launched GOES-16, our new geostationary satellite. And its incredibly high resolution, both in time and in space, allows us to see rotation for the first time from outer space. I've never, ever seen this before. When this radar image was released... I, or sorry, when the satellite image was released, I watched this animation like a hundred times over because we've never been able to see storms spinning from space. That's why supercells are single-celled storms. They rotate. Okay, as we dig into this, watch this video. We're going to start it right here. This was a simulation done on the Blue Waters computer of what a supercell looks like. So we're in a grid space there, and we're going to look on top of it, and we're going to fly right into a, a, a supercell that was simulated on a supercomputer. Now watch this. Ready? Here's things I'm going to be teaching about. From the top down, that is the overshooting top, this feature right here. It's surrounded by this massive anvil cloud. We'll learn how anvil clouds form in a minute. Here we go. We're about to fly right through about 60,000 feet above the ground. There it is. And now we see the main updraft of the thunderstorm. You see, it's not big, but it's powerful. And we're going to watch this animation show us how the whole thing rapidly rotates, giving birth to the tornado, which is right down here. You see, these are all the things we're going to try to understand and figure out in the next few moments here. How does this storm form and what does it do? Because it's a powerful, powerful expression of weather on Earth. Well, if we kind of show it to you all put together, I've got my own drawing here in PowerPoint. So I've drawn for you the outline of a thunderstorm, an outline of a supercell. We're going to learn about three main components of the supercell, that being the main updraft here, which creates the overshooting top, the anvil, and the mammatus clouds. We'll talk about them in a few moments. We'll then talk about the forward flank downdraft and the rear flank downdraft. Those are the two big downdrafts. And then finally, the third thing, we'll talk about the formation of the wall cloud and the tornado. Now, we're going to dig deep into this. I'm not going to pull any punches. I want to show you how this stuff really, really works. So fasten your seatbelt. Let's get going with this, all right? On radar, what do we need to make sure we understand? Well, the supercell almost always has a structure like you see down here. It has a rear flank downdraft where the hook echo exists. It has an updraft, which is inside of the hook echo. That's where the tornado exists. So the hook echo wraps around the tornado itself. Most supercells have a hail core where we see DBZ, radar reflectivity, DBZ over 60, and has a big forward flank on it, all of this, where the main downdraft forms. We got to unpack all of it, figure it all out, and try to understand it, and this is going to be fun. So sit back. Here we go. Let's start from the top down. This is one of my favorite Im images from the International Space Station. We're seeing two major components. First, the updraft of the storm is here. When the updraft slams in the stratosphere, it spreads out horizontally like this. And as it spreads out, it creates this big cloud, I'll circle it for you here, called the anvil cloud. Now the anvil is just again where the updraft hits the stratosphere and spreads out horizontally. The bigger the anvil cloud, the badder the storm, okay? Big flat cloud. Now where the updraft briefly penetrates into the stratosphere, we get this little bubbly part that you see here. 
We call that an overshooting top. That's where the storm has so much energy as it rises, it briefly penetrates into the stable stratosphere. So those are the two features that are on top. Now, underneath the anvil, which we can't see right in this area, there's a cloud type called the Mammatus cloud. And this is a very rare cloud type because it forms in descending air. It's the only cloud type to do so. Now, it shares its root with the same uh, word mammary. So they're often called udder clouds. They look like a cow's udder. See them hanging down below the anvil cloud? My point to all of you is when you see Mammatus like this, you need to know that there are some powerful thunderstorms nearby and you're looking at the underneath side of the anvil when you see them. So the anvil on top, the overshooting top just above the main updraft, and then the mammatus clouds hanging down underneath the anvil. Now, very importantly, most supercells have powerful hail cores where the reflectivity values are over 60 dBZ. One of my friends, Jim Linder, took this video and let me use it in this particular lecture. Watch what happened when Jim drove through the hail core of a thunderstorm. I apologize, I tried to edit this for, uh, for the swearing, but I couldn't quite get it right. It's okay, just watch. Ready? Here we go. Now, there's a couple of good lessons from this. First, when you go storm chasing, storm chasing old crappy cars like this Buick LeSabre. Who cares what happens to it? Secondly, Jim knows that he should have not been where he was. That's because Jim had access to radar data. He could have looked to see his position with respect to the hail core of the storm. Now, he got caught. He was on a great chase and just got caught in some massive hail. But this is why hail scares me so much. By the way, that is the world record largest hailstone. That one was 19 inches in circumference, 8 inches wide at its widest, and weighed about 2 pounds. When it fell from the sky, it did so at incredible speeds. When it fell, it was actually punching holes through roofs like this. Now, this guy in the background who found this hailstone has a great story. In the middle of this massive supercell producing these hailstones that went over his house, he ran out in the storm and picked that stone up from its divot in the ground. He brought it inside and ran it under the sink and washed it off and then put it in the freezer. Now he did that because he knew when his wife came home and saw how damaged everything was, he was going to toss it into the blender and make her a daiquiri out of it. Well, thankfully he called the National Weather Service instead and they came out the next day and measured it even after it sat sublimating in the freezer for 24 hours. It's still measured as the world record largest hailstone. And that sucker is a monster. Now, what have we been learning about? Well, look at this radar animation. This shows us radar reflectivity. We know that we get over 60 dBZ, which is out of the reds into these colors, we're looking for hail. Vivian is right here where that guy was. Watch a supercell come over. See those pinks and whites and purples? That's the hail core of these supercell thunderstorms, okay? So, just a reiteration of some stuff we've already learned here. So I wanna make sure that when you are done with this lecture, you know what I'm about to teach you, so pay close attention. I've got this powerful supercell thunderstorm in these radar images uh, from Tuscaloosa, Alabama during, April, during the April 2011 severe weather outbreak. I'm going to put a line around the outline of the supercell, okay? So that's what we got here. Now, we need to make sure that we recognize these features. The image on the right, that image is the radar reflectivity image, intensity. The image on the left, that's the radar radial velocity image, 
wind speed direction. What you need to make sure that you remember is this. Whenever we use radars to detect tornadoes, we look for hook echoes and velocity couplets. Now, what are hook echoes and velocity couplets? couplets? Well, remember, the storm is moving in that direction, the arrow I just showed you there, southwest and northeast. We also know that there's often hail where the reflectivity gets quite high. There were some pockets of small hail in this storm. In fact, you can see right there, uh, radar reflectivity over 55 or over 60 dBZ. But it's the velocity cup that I want to make sure that you see. Here's the hook echo. Let's see it up here. See the hook echo on the back? This is just a zoomed in version. The velocity couplet is right here. Red outbound, green inbound. So that means this part of the storm was going in this direction, and this part of the storm was going in that direction. And the whole thing was violently spinning here, and that is the location of the tornado. Now, one thing to point out here, <clears throat> if you'd like to safely observe a supercell and look in the hook echo to see the tornado, you want to be right here where I drew this star. It's to the southeast of the storm. Why? You can view right inside here, I'll put a T, where the tornado is located. The storm is moving away from you, not toward you, and you can see safely inside of the hook. So when we storm chase, there's a rule. Get south and get east. Get south and east. That's the safest place to be. Now, this particular tornado, as it was going over Tuscaloosa, Alabama, was doing some serious damage. Maybe a few moments ago, some of you were wondering why I pointed out this as the hail and not this. Well, the reason is because that's not hail. That's what we call a debris ball. The tornado has picked up enough debris that it threw it high enough in the sky that the radar scanned it and the radar detected the debris, not hail, but the debris. And whenever we see these on radar, we uh, it's a scary sight. We know that a lot of damage is being done. All right, test time. Ready? Supercell, producing a tornado is approaching your location. You are here. You have options. You need to drive to see the best view that you can get of the tornado, but stay safe. You are here. The supercell is there and it's coming toward you. Do you drive north? Do you drive south? Do you drive west? Or do you stay put? What would you do? Got your answer? Well, don't drive north. If you drive north, you're going to miss this. Don't drive west. So don't go north. Don't go west. If you go west, you're also not going to be able to see into the tornado. Don't stay put. You're going to die. Basically, if you stay put, things are going to happen like this. Some light rain is going to hit you, then some moderate rain, then some heavy rain, then some massive hail. And after the hail, it's going to clear up for a moment, tornado is going to wipe you out, and then the hook echo is going to come back over and hit you again with hail. Don't stay put. Drive south. You see, if you drove south to about right here, the hook echo, which is here where the tornado is, is going to go just like this. And if you're here, the hook echo will pass right to your north. You can look right inside of it and see the tornado. So that's just a good example of what to do in storm chasing, all right? Get south. All right, I want to talk to you about tornado genesis, how tornadoes form, but we're going to take a look at this from two different perspectives. What I've got for you here is called a water spout, a water spout. That's a picture that I took back in Omaha, Nebraska a couple of years ago. Now, what is this thing? Well, a water spout is a little vortex, a little rotation in the atmosphere that formed over water. If it formed over land, we call it a land spout. These are way different from supercell tornadoes, and I want to show you the difference. All right, so I was in Omaha, Nebraska, and on that day, we had this boundary, this front coming in from the northwest. We had another one coming in from the southeast like this, and they collided right there. Now, that's our trigger. That trigger led to the development of a thunderstorm. There it is. I kind of drew you a thunderstorm here. But that thunderstorm produced a tornado, but not a supercell type tornado. Let's talk about it. You see, as each of those boundaries collided, we had winds on one side coming from one direction, winds on the other coming from the other direction. And as they did, they began to swirl right in the middle there. It looks something like this. Well, that swirl was then stretched vertically by the thunderstorm that developed over the top of it and began to rotate faster. So on top of this swirling wind near the surface, due to horizontal wind shear, that's where winds come from different direction at the same level, horizontal wind shear, we took the circulation and stretched it vertically. 
but horizontal wind shear does not lead to strong winds. This particular water spout probably only produced wind speeds of 30, 40, maybe 50 miles an hour. Supercells can produce tornadoes like this one, Marquette, Kansas. The winds in this one, well, well over 150 miles an hour, and at times approaching 200 miles an hour. Entirely different beast. So I just showed you the water spout or the land spout. They form in the same way. Weak, weak, weak tornadic circulations. The supercell, which you see here, forms on vertical wind shear. And we got to talk about that. Now, a couple years ago, I took my kids to the St. Louis uh, Science Museum. And when we were there, there was an exhibit on tornadoes. And I was looking at it, and I wanted to read because I was curious. I study this. So this is what I read. They had a sign up that said Tornado Alley, right? So Tornado Alley. It's kind of outlined for you there. Missouri right there in the middle. Landscape features in the Midwest create conditions favorable for tornadoes to form. No mountain ranges block the warm, moist Gulf of Mexico air. That's true. Or the uh, moisture from the, coming from the Caribbean Sea. This region also receives cool, dry air from Canada. And then I read this. The combination of these factors produces numerous and violent tornadoes more than in any other region on Earth. And I was kind of like, wait a second. I hear this talked about all the time. For some reason, people just seem to think that every time cold Canadian air meets Gulf of, moisture, uh, Gulf of Mexico moisture, that boom, tornadoes happen. That's not what happens here. All that does is trigger the development of thunderstorms. The formation of the tornado is much more elegant, much more localized. It's a micro-scale event, and I want to teach you how this works. By the way, they got this all wrong. You see, Tornado Alley is there. You see? Here's Tornado Alley. Here's Dixie Alley. They didn't bother to include all of that. In fact, they've got it in the wrong orientation as well. I wish I would have brought a Sharpie along. I would have fixed this for them. Well, if we continue, there was another sign. And it said this. Are you ready? <clears throat> Tornadoes are dramatic examples of climactic forces at work. Tornadoes are the most powerful storms in the Midwest with winds up to 200 miles per hour. Tornadoes generally form in warm, wet air mass. When a warm, wet air mass from the south is trapped beneath a cooler, drier air mass from the north. While the warm air tries to rise higher into the atmosphere, the cool air is rapidly moving closer to the ground. Turbulence, or violent mixing of air, develops as the edges of the two air masses move along each other. This mixing can soon turn into a strong whirl. When the tip of the spinning column of air touches the ground, the tornado picks up dust and debris, giving it its characteristic gray color. What? Ah, uh, if I would have brought my Sharpie, I would have done this. Ready? Tornadoes are dramatic. Tornadoes are the most powerful storms in the Midwest, with winds that can exceed 300 miles an hour. Ready? Tornadoes form when the spinning column of air touches the ground and picks up dust and debris, giving its characteristic gray color. All the rest of this is garbage. And I think it's time we learn how this really works. So here we go. No punches being held here. This is out of my 400 level class notes. Sit back and watch. You see, with the land spout and the water spout, it was horizontal wind shear. With the supercell, it's a vertical wind shear. You see this plot of land I've drawn here? We've got three dimensions, north, south, east, west, and up, down. When the winds increase rapidly with height like this, you can get the air to spin in a vortex tube like you see here. So the wind shear in the lowest about mile of the atmosphere creates this horizontally aligned tube of air. These happen all the time across the Great Plains, across Tornado Alley, across Dixie Alley. Wind shear is the first ingredient a rapidly changing wind with height. Now what happens to that tube of air? Well, let's kind of stretch it out here and put it on the ground again. So see it here? It's the same tube I just showed you. If a thunderstorm comes along and its updraft rises just like this, well, that tube of air can be pulled vertically just like that. Now what's the point? Well, if I took that tube that was once horizontally oriented and stretched vertically, well, the storm will begin to take on the rotation of that tube of air. So the vortex is tilted upward, forcing the updraft, which is in this location, to rotate. Well, what does that look like? It looks like what I've already shown you. Remember that animation we watched? You saw that updraft, which is this part here, rotating. This was from a tube of air that was turned vertically in the atmosphere and, and began to get the whole storm to spin. 
it's the circulation we see right here inside of the supercell, giving it its characteristic hook echo. We call it the mesocyclone, the rotating updraft of a supercell thunderstorm, mesocyclone. Well, let's keep going. Beneath the mesocyclone, we often see a wall cloud being formed. Why does that wall cloud form? Well, as the mesocyclone rapidly rises and rotates, it produces clouds and precipitation. And most of that due to wind shear, because remember the winds are getting faster and faster aloft, most of that precipitation gets thrown in the downstream direction, which is why the main downdraft of the thunderstorm shown here in blue arrows, which I'm kind of drawing over, gives us the forward flank of the storm. Because see, the whole storm system is moving in this direction with the wind shear. So this is the forward side. Now what's neat about this is the forward flank of the storm produces a downdraft that gets re-ingested or pulled right back up into the thunderstorm. See, I told you this was more complicated than uh, you know warm air from Gulf of Mexico meeting cold air from Canada, all right? You see the storm visibly rotates and this wall cloud begins to form. And it forms at this lower altitude. See it here, this is the wall cloud. Because the storm's forward flank downdraft is getting pulled right back into the main updraft. And it will be from this wall cloud that the tornado forms. We'll get there in just a few seconds. So again, updraft produces the forward flank downdraft, and that air gets recycled. See the circulation here? It gets recycled just like that back into the main updraft. Here we go. Let's watch this happen. You see the warm moist air comes in, creates the updraft. The updraft produces the precipitation on this side. And when that downdraft hits the ground, it produces a little mini cold front. Remember how outflow downdraft is cooler air? Well, watch what happens as the wall cloud forms right in this area. You see that downdraft, as the air descends like this, forces the air to spiral. And that spiraling air, because it's hitting the ground and spreading out, okay? That spiraling air gets sucked right back up into the storm. And as it does so, it forces the lowering of this cloud base and it forces that cloud base to spin. Now, why does it lower? It lowers because the moisture in the air in the downdraft is very high and it lowers the base of the cloud. Now, it looks something like this. Here's the main updraft of the supercell. This is a real one. The main downdraft. This really juicy high dew point air, I got it labeled here, gets ingested back into the storm and it is rotating. And that forms this cloud called a wall cloud. And the wall cloud forms a barrier around the tornado. So this supercell here, and you're going to be able to watch this video. I've linked it after this lecture here. This supercell here is producing this cloud feature, which I've labeled right here with this arrow called the wall cloud. It will be from within this wall cloud that the tornado will form. This is what it looks like in real time. Check it out here. What are we looking at? This is the wall cloud. This is the rotation in the supercell way up here. And we're going to see from inside this rugged wall cloud a tornado emerge. A former University of Illinois PhD student Bruce Lee took this video and allowed us to use it. Now I told you, you can visibly see the wall cloud rotate. And there it is. You see the funnel cloud? The funnel cloud has emerged. The wall cloud is that ragged cloud wrapping around the tornado, forming a wall around it. Hence the name wall cloud. Absolutely breathtaking to see. So what's going on here? Well, the whole storm is rotating up here. That's the mesocyclone. The wall cloud is this little rotation you see down here. And finally, the funnel cloud emerged right there. Three different senses of rotation. Well, where did that come from? We got to answer that question. Well, we now know where the wall cloud came from. It came from the forward flank of the storm, producing a downdraft that got sucked right back up into the main updraft. But where does this tornadic circulation come from? Sorry, right here. That's our next question. Well, let's zoom into the backside of the storm. Remember, there are two downdrafts. There's the forward flank, which we've been talking about, and the rear flank. 
The rear flank downdraft hits the ground the same way that the forward flank does. And as it does, it also kicks up a small scale circulation. So the rear flank downdraft hits the ground and creates another vortex tube like you see right here. Now the question is, what happens to that? Well, let me show it to you first. This is an animation from the Dodge City, Kansas radar. Do you see this feature right here? Watch it again. That is the rear flank downdraft. That is the vortex tube. And can you see how it's getting sucked right into the main updraft, which is right here inside the hook? That's what I'm talking about. So it hits the ground, descends, creates that tube, and watch what happens next. The thunderstorm grabs that tube of air and tilts it vertically. Think of it like a spinning, I don't know, rope or tube. We just pulled the middle of it up just like this. You see this part right here that's rotating counterclockwise? That is the circulation that becomes a tornado. The clockwise rotating one does not. Now, I'm only explaining to you one type of tornado genesis theory. There are other theories about how tornadoes form, but this is the most accepted one at this point. It's not that the others are wrong, it's just that this is the one that's most widely published. It is this circulation that becomes a tornado. Now at this point, I'm sure your mind is going, what in the world, Snodgrass, do I need to learn about this? This is tough to understand. Well, this is what I want you to get. The storm has three senses of rotation. It has the main mesocycle, and that's the rotating updraft. It has a wall cloud, and then it has a tornado underneath it. Those three senses of rotation form by these processes. First, the rear flank downdraft descends and creates this vortex tube along the ground. That vortex tube is tilted vertically and stretched into the storm base. As you stretch it, its force is spent faster. And finally, as it's being stretched vertically by the conservation of angular momentum, it forms the tornado. So mesocyclone, wall cloud, tornado. Complicated to understand. Here's what I want you to take away from this. Supercells rotate. Listen carefully. Supercells rotate and they are able to concentrate that rotation into a focused, narrow column of rotating air we call a tornado. They form, that rotation forms on vertical wind shear. Now, if you're worried at this point about what I'm going to ask you about this on the test, that's the key point I want you to remember. Supercells rotate and they concentrate and stretch their rotation. But I was not going to shy away from showing you how this actually works. Those are my notes from my upper level classes, and these are the big details I want you to get out of this. Now, when we form a tornado, if the tornado is very small like this one, I'm going to tell you what the circulation looks like. Yes, it's violently spinning around like this, but in the middle of this tornado, air is actually rapidly rising. You see, in small tornadoes, in the center, the air is basically going up. But as the tornado gets wider and wider, it strengthens. And that is because the tornado goes through a process called vortex breakdown. Now, remember back in the lecture, the first lecture on tornadoes, I said, hey, the wider the tornado becomes, the more powerful it becomes. Now, if you think about this from a conservation of angular momentum perspective, a system that is spinning, if it gets wider and wider as it spins, it actually spins slower. Yet the tornado, as it widens, like you can see here in the two animations I have over here on the right, actually gets more powerful. And this is why. Bullet points, A through D. When we initially make our tornado, it is composed of a singular updraft right here in the middle. Air is ascending. But because it is spinning so violently, centrifugal forces, combined with extremely low air pressure in the center, allow the tornado to get wider and wider with time. When that happens, instead of having an updraft in the center, a downdraft actually forms in the middle of the tornado while the air rapidly rises right along its periphery. Now, what's the point behind me telling you this? Well, if air is rapidly descending in the middle of this tornado and rapidly ascending on the outside edges, the descending air will interact with the ascending air, producing these violent circulations on the edge of the tornado just like this. And what this does is it can produce individual suction vortices within the larger tornadic circulation. Now, what the heck am I talking about? Check this out. I've given you the outline 
of the edge of the main tornado. So the main tornado is spinning around and around like this. But on the inside, we formed three separate little suction vortices. And each one of those formed as the vortex broke down and got wider and wider. Now, the whole tornado at its widest may only be spinning at 100 miles an hour. But each of the little suction vortices may be spinning at 150 miles an hour. Combined, they can do some serious damage. And that's because combined, their wind speeds may exceed 250. Let me give you a case in point. Remember this particular picture uh, from the Washington, Illinois tornado provided by Alyssa? Well, the edge of the tornado is way out here and way over there. But do you see these little scars? Each one of those is where a suction vortex went wrapping around this tornado. Amazing to see that. So big tornadoes are often composed of smaller circulations called suction vortices, and they are the most destructive part of the tornado. So when we come back to this picture of the Rochelle wedge tornado, the very first picture I showed you in the tornado lecture, well, we call it a wedge because it's so wide. It is actually wider here than it is tall. And that is how they get the name wedge. Wedge tornadoes like this are often made up of a bunch of little suction vortices. We can't see them because of all the condensation that's in this. But now you know that this is the wall cloud. And this is the main mesocyclone. We have three senses of rotation all put together to make this tornadic circulation emerge from the bottom. Amazing, amazing to see all of that. All right, I'm going to show you a couple of screen grabs from one of my favorite movies, Twister. Okay, it came out in 1996. By the way, Twister was the very first movie ever released on DVD, something kind of need to know about it. Now, in terms of bad science in movie, Twister does its fair share of bad science. But I'm going to tell you something. Of all the movies I've ever seen that talk about severe weather, Twister is actually the best scientifically, yet it's still bad. And why I want to show you this particular scene is because at the opening scene of the movie Twister, there's this massive tornado that kills the main character's father. And it says that this all started in June of 1969. And the dad, who's about to be killed by this tornado, is looking at Gary England, a real TV meteorologist here, talking about a tornado warning in Oklahoma. And he says, hey, the TV says it's big, might be an F5. So this is the dad talking. The TV says it's big, might be an F5. When I saw this particular scene in the movie, I got kind of confused because my first question was, how did Gary England, or the dad, talk about this tornado as being an F5? Because in 1969, this guy had yet to release his Fujita scale. This is Dr. Ted Fujita, and he has a remarkable story. Let me tell you it. In 1945, the United States, in retaliation to a bombing on Pearl Harbor, dropped a large nuclear bomb on the city of Nagasaki. What you may not know is that Nagasaki was not the first target to be chosen in Japan. The first target was a city called Kokura, but on the day of the bombing, Kokura had a bunch of cloud cover. And because the bombing, uh, the guidance system used a visible, you know, a guy looking through a site to drop the bomb, he couldn't see the city through the clouds. So a secondary target had been assigned, and it was Nagasaki. In Kokura, Dr. Ted Fujita was studying, working on his PhD. And he was studying fluid dynamics, among a lot of different things. The bomb was dropped on a neighboring city, Nagasaki, sparing his life. He got permission shortly thereafter to go study the blast radius of the Nagasaki bomb. And he began to equate some of the damage he saw with downburst damage that he was researching. Well, fast forward 10 years later, the United States and Japan are now in a friendly relationship. Dr. Ted Fujita is now studying at the University of Chicago. What is he studying? He's studying years upon years, thousands of damage reports from tornadoes. And he's studying them so that he could basically come up with his Fujita scale. The Fujita scale, a scale by which we rank tornado damage, the Fujita scale, Decades of research went into this, helped us better understand, better warn, and save lives. So it's interesting. Cloud cover in Kokura spared his life in 1945. He then came to the United States and worked on tornado research, saving the 
countless numbers of lives in the U.S. from tornado damage and deaths. <sighs> amazing, amazing story. Well, what did he come up with? Well, Dr. Ted Fujita studied 70 years worth of tornado damage, got a bunch of reports, 30,000 different reports. He based all of his, dam uh, all of his uh, scale off of damage, mostly damage to a home. He assigned a value. That value went from F0 to F5. In 2007, we released a new scale called the EF scale, the Enhanced Vegeta scale. And the big difference here is a lot more research went into looking at different damage indicators. Like what happens if a tornado hits a soft pine tree versus an oak tree? What if it hits a long span store like a Lowe's versus a home? What if it hits, um, you know, a three-story apartment complex versus a single-story family home? We looked at all of these different indicators, 28 different damage indicators, to refine the original F scale. Both scales still have these problems. Are you ready? The scale is subjective. It's subject to the experience of the surveyor. A brand new storm data, uh, storm damage surveyor will likely rank storm damage worse than it actually is compared to a more experienced storm damage surveyor. Okay. Secondly, what about non-uniform construction standards? Okay. Same tornado hits poorly constructed area versus a well-constructed area, you get entirely different damage reports. But because we're going to be using the F scale or EF scale to assign a wind speed to a tornado, well, that makes that's a very important thing. Next, what if the tornado doesn't hit anything? An EF5 tornado is the same damage as an F0 tornado to a grassy field for the most part. It's got to hit something to destroy it. And finally, we will only know the strength of the tornado after a damage survey is done. You see, tornadoes are so powerful they destroy anemometers. We can scan them with radar, but that's that's a great way to get wind information, but it'd be perfect if we could get you know, an actual anemometer in it. So what we have to do is we have to look at what the tornado eats, what it destroys, and then compare that to a wind speed range based on research. So that's it. Four major problems with the F scale. In the movie Twister, they break one of the biggest rules you could ever break with tornadoes. They often look at tornadoes and say, hey, look, over there, there's an F3 coming. You can't do that. The only way we ever know if it ever achieved an F3 status on the Enhanced Vegeta Scale is when the National Weather Service comes out and does an assessment. So it can't be used on the fly. Now, originally, Dr. Vegeta's scale went up to an F12. That's right, his original scale went up to Mach 1 wind speeds. But he theorized that the fastest winds we would possibly ever get out of this would probably be around 360 miles an hour. So that's where the F5 category ends. So there it is, originally up to an F12. The new scale, the EF scale, well, here are the big differences. When it comes to EF0 tornadoes, the wind speed category is actually a little bit higher. But when it comes to EF5 tornadoes, well, an old EF5 used to have wind speeds in excess of 262 miles an hour. Now an EF5, over 200. Sorry, an F5, 262, an EF5, over 200. So what this means is tornadoes in the past that could get to the strong end of an F3 are now categorized as an EF5. So it is easier to achieve the higher rankings on the new Enhanced Vegeta scale. This is the first ever EF5 tornado. The new Enhanced scale came out on Groundhog's Day in 2007, and in May of 2007, the Greensburg, Kansas tornado showed up. Now look at it. It's got everything we've been talking about. It has a well-defined rear flank downdraft. See me outlining it here? This is the hook echo. It's got a hail course. See the bright purples in there, the pinks and purples? That's where the hail formed. Here's the big forward flank of the thunderstorm over here, and here's the main updraft, and the tornado sat right inside of there. Now remember, most of these storms move from the southwest to the northeast. So backtrack this storm, and you'll see that this hook echo sat right over Greensburg. Now this particular tornado, we've talked about it. It hit at night which means without radar technology, we would have never have known it was coming. As it went over, May, uh, May 4, 2007, I remember telling my wife, I told you the story before, I thought this was going to be the new deadliest tornado in U.S. history, surpassing the March 18, 1925 tornado in Illinois. But as it went over, there was a 30-minute warning time because of radar imagery just like this. All of that was compliments of the research of Dr. Ted Fujita and Glenn Stout and Don Staggs here at the University of Illinois. Remember me telling you their story about finding the first hook echo back in 1953? Well, 
Look at what happened to Kansas, Greensburg, Greenberg, Kansas. That's the town before. This is the town after. 95% of the structures destroyed. Here's a little, uh, you know, subdivision. Before, after. Incredible to see that damage. And to finish this lecture, I just want to show you this. You know, I've been teaching you a lot about severe weather, a lot about tornado safety, especially in these last two lectures. See this house right here? I'm guessing that guy took Atmos 120. <laughs> that was one of the only houses that wasn't destroyed. So the stuff I've been teaching you will keep you safe. Use this information and don't forget it because in the United States, well, we've got 75% of the world's tornadoes and that is a lot. And the chances of you over your lifetime seeing a tornado if you stay in the United States are pretty high. Now you know what to do to be safe. You know what to do to detect these tornadoes on radar. You know the different components of the storm to be looking for in the atmosphere. And now you're educated and know what to do so that you don't become a statistic that I get to share in my lectures. That's it. That's how tornadoes form. That's how they destroy stuff. Amazing to see the powerful expression that the supercell can produce in making these violently rotating, rapidly rotating columns of air that extend from the cloud to the ground.